Welcome to an introduction to sociocracy with Finn Lewis and Abby Hanley. Um, we'll introduce ourselves in a sec. Um, just briefly, the goals of this session are a quick overview of sociocracy and some of its benefits, um, sharing our experience of, of uh, use in our organisations, um, uh, both at Agile Collective, where I'm from, and at Outlandish, where Abby is from, um, and a look at how it might work for us in local Gov Drupal, um, and comments and questions, of course, uh, and a bit of discussion at the end. Um, Abby suggested a, a good good way to to take comments throughout the presentation, maybe in the chat, in the Google chat. So feel free to write things into the, the chat as we go. And um, if it, you know, there's few of us enough, few enough of us that you know, if it makes sense to talk about it at that point, we can do. And otherwise, we'll come to them at the end. Um, so briefly, yeah, Agile Collective. I, I'm Finn Finn Lewis from Agile Collective. We are a creative digital services uh, company. Um, we've been working with local gov people for a long time. Uh, most of you know me and know us, um, but there's more of us. There's even more of us than that. It's about 13 of us, I think, in total. Um, and uh, we're also a cooperative, and we've been using sociocracy to govern our co-op for uh, a couple of years now. Um, and over to Abby for Outlandish. And quite a similar story. We're a cooperative, worker-owned, and have been using sociocracy as our sort of governance structure and way to make decisions for probably like seven or eight years in, um, and still learning. Um, and I uh, do the kind of project management, program management, operational type stuff for our digital projects. So Agile and Outlandish are quite similar size and we do kind of similar work, but um, Agile is more like Drupal and we're more like WordPress and data. So that's kind of the distinction, but there's loads of sort of similarities um, and we've done lots of kind of peer learning between each other and done lots of collaborations, which is great. Um, next slide, please. I love saying that. Um, <laughs> there we go, sorry. And one of the collaborations we've been doing is, uh, is Aaron is another member of Agile um, and we've like, formed a kind of collaboration, a group called Building Out, which stands for Openness, Understanding and Trust, which is basically bringing out our kind of working practices and helping others to have a go at them and see if they work. Because um, we found loads of benefits of like, you know, having better, more trusting and more effective kind of relationships to be able to actually achieve our goals. Um, so this is kind of a new thing that we're sort of experimenting with doing it a little bit more explicitly in, in, in the outside world instead of just doing it as our internal processes. Um, but yeah, we think the foundations are like openness, understanding and trust. Um, so that's the bit, bit of intro. Please like definitely do like ask questions as we go um, and um, we'll try and kind of answer some. But the background is like a little bit of history of sociocracy. Some of you know it, some of you've only just heard the word. Um, it kind of comes, uh, the first sort of use of the word was like 100, what was that, 70 years ago. Um, uh, but the, when they started kind of practicing, it was more of a, uh, from the Quakers, so in the 20s, um, in Holland. It's been in Holland for like, uh, that's where it was born really. Um, and it used kind of Quaker principles um, and it wasn't until the 70s that someone called Gerard Endenberg actually uh, developed it enough to bring into sort of a business situation um, and the circle kind of organisation and the actual structural governance um, of circles he started using in his own business. Um, and it kind of stayed around in Holland for quite a long time. It wasn't until like the turn of the millennium, so the you know, like 2000s that it started to kind of come out of um, use of Holland and kind of going into a wider a number of countries um, and then it kind of accelerated so I think the book came out in early 2004 so we the people have we got we the people as a link it is at the it. end of it yeah the end there's a link to that so there's like we'll send you the link to these slides and and at the end there's some like extra reading material and all that kind of stuff but um this was the sort of <clears throat> book by John Buck who is part of sociocracy for all um and then it kind of there was lots of sort of um uh, combination so agile project management methodology started to kind of be brought in and kind of included or integrated and it um and sociocracy 3.0 was born um and then there's lots of kind of organizations and networks that kind of use different slightly different versions of sociocracy but it's ultimately an open source kind of approach that you can choose the bits that you want to use you can do it whole whole wholly 
Um, and generally we say start somewhere small and see where it goes rather than trying to like do everything all at once. Um, the one thing to note is holacracy is something you might have heard of. It's trademarked. So we probably have to say like some some kind of statement after saying the word holacracy because they're really like legally like on us if we ever mention the word holacracy. Uh, but it's a trademarked version of sociocracy, which is a little bit more like top down than um, than kind of more open source sociocracy. Um, and yeah, so basically there's loads of different kind of versions, but it's ultimately centered around the three core principles that are on the next slide. <laughs> next one after that. That's just a title. Um, so these are the kind of three core uh, pillars or principles, whatever word you want to use, that, um, that sociocracy represents. Um, and I think Tim mentioned the consent process. So that's the decision making. So like there's, a, there's a particular structured process that you can make decisions as a group. Um, there's the circle structure, which is how you actually might organize an organization, but also a network. So it doesn't have to be it, like this is why this is quite um, interesting for this project is that it can easily be used across networks. It doesn't have to be within a sort of structured legal organization. Um, and we'll talk to you about how Agile and Outlandish both use circles, like fairly similarly, but there will be differences and you can kind of mould it to your own needs. Um, and the third kind of pillar is around learning and like we don't know how to do these things. So let's try, let's test, let's review and let's try again. So it's, it's kind of a learning iterative approach to everything that we're doing um, with the mindset that we don't really know the answers. So we've got to try to find out. And it's all centered around having a shared purpose or get aim or goal. And that's really core to it is that it's not about, as I said, being part of a single organization. It's actually that the group, the circle, the team that's making a decision, the team that's learning has a clear and agreed and shared kind of purpose, whether that's, um, I don't know, putting on a great Christmas party or whether it's changing the world using Drupal or whatever, but that you all agree and kind of um, trying to move towards a, a, a shared purpose. I think you're next, aren't you? Are you? Uh, oh, so I is this more you. principles, I think? Yeah, so just kind of breaking those kind of principles down a little bit. Sociocracy and kind of the implementation of it is really action focused. So let's get something done. There's a saying that I'm not sure if we've got as a quote in the slide, but we use all of the time in Outlandish and it's um, good enough for now and safe enough to try. So it's like, let's try something rather than talk about it forever and never quite get the answer. Um, it, there's a real focus on understanding, not just from one person, but for, from us all. If we understand what's happening, then we feel safer and we're more likely to actually do more things or take more risks or kind of try more things if we actually understand what's going on. Um, it's really about understanding that there are differences in the team and they have different opinions and different directions and different inputs and different values. And it's really trying to celebrate that um, and, and bring it in so that it positively affects people's decisions and things that we do. Um, it's also about distributing work. And I think a lot of people when they first read about sociocracy is like, but that means everyone has to decide everything. No, no, it's not about that at all. It's about being able to define where the responsibility for the decision is. And it should always be the smallest group and pushed out from like the center circle as much as possible. So you're delegating the decision making um, to the people that are really going to be able to make a good decision about it. Um, the process helps it to be very transparent. So it's very clear when you're making a proposal. So therefore, it's very clear when a decision is made and then it can be documented and shared. Whereas quite often in organisations where there's not a clear decision making process, it's sort of, is that a decision, isn't it, who who was in it? It's all kind of very, it, it's straightforward to document and have minutes and kind of go, right, these were the decisions we made in the last quarter. Um, I've already said about learning and, then, and the, the next two are kind of very similar, continual reflection and improvement. So always looking back and going, huh, how could we do that better to then move on and go and move forward and a real like growth mindset of always trying to improve. And the other thing that we really think is as important is around bringing in the sort of emotional intelligence um, and 
you know, what's really going on for us as humans in this room making this decision. And sometimes uh, someone might be feeling quite scared, even though you think it's a very simple decision, but they've had like a reaction to it. So it's just being aware of the power in the room, like who has the most influence if there are people with like different emotional reactions to it and just building that confidence and sort of understanding between you about that. You can move on now, Finn. Thanks, Savvy. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, um, circles, uh, circles, what are circles? So circles uh, form the, the, the sort of um, the structure of, of the, the circles, <laughs> the structure of sociocracy, yeah, the circles. Um, this quote is from Ted Rao, who's uh, one of uh, part of sociocracy for all. Power is distributed with the work. Um, so that's what Abby was saying around, you know, um, the decision-making power is given to the people who are best placed to make that decision. Um, and so, in uh, that is within a circle. Um, one of the reasons this is, is that uh, especially in larger groups, um, it's very difficult to make decisions, it's very inefficient to make decisions with a lot of people. And, you know, um, once you get to 20, 40 people, whatever, like we've had in our product group meetings, that can be tricky. So um, a circle is um, a collection of people who are going to make decisions and uh, do some work around a particular, a particular thing. Um, it's worth mentioning that these might be permanent circles or they might be temporary circles. So working groups is something that we've talked about before. Um, in this case, you know, a circle could be a working group. Um, what does it contain? A clear aim and domain. So again, like Abby said, this is really important. What's the purpose of this of this group? What's the purpose of what are we trying to do here? Um, so in a in a in a working group, that might be to develop a particular feature. Um, in in a, in an agile collective, you know. Um, uh, in, in business development, for example, it might be to oversee new new business work. Um, so very important to define the clear aim and domain of each circle. Um, working agreements, what are these, Abby? I should know this. Um, just It's kind of connected to roles, so agreeing what, how you're going to work. Okay. Like a sort of set of values or principles by which, how, how you're going to work. Yeah, so so um, in in the circles at Agile Collective, for example, we will define somebody who's going to lead um, a particular, uh, you know, sort of the the the, the group, the circle. Uh, somebody else who will facilitate meetings, and somebody else who will take notes. So just being really clear about those those roles where needed. Um, and that might well be the same person in smaller groups. Um, meeting schedules and agendas. Uh, just being clear about when we're meeting, how often, what the plans for that meeting are, what the outcomes are. Uh, and transparency and shared minutes, of course, um, trying to document any decisions that are made so that people outside the circle can see what's been happening. Um, and agreed budget and resources. I put budget in inverted commas there just because if we're in an organization where we don't have, you know, sort of necessarily financial uh, budgets, but we do have like time resources. And so, you know, agreeing how much time we're expecting to put into a particular circle. Um, what's the next what are we looking to achieve um so yeah this shared purpose is 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 you know really important um in a circle so making sure that the right people are involved in in a particular circle um sharing of power and responsibility um so is this what we're looking to what were we this is uh, right this is this is reflecting on on actually when we brought in um sociocracy to outlandish or to agile collective is that right happy um Yes. So yeah, why why we did it? So yeah, shared purpose, real sharing of power and responsibility, um, uh, more voices being heard. I mean, in, in in agile collectives case, you know, we were growing to a point where, um, um, in fact, we grew to a point where we actually had a sort of smaller sort of coordinating committee, um, and so we kind of centralised the power a bit, and that kind of perhaps shifted it a little bit uh, away from everyone being heard. So um, so yeah, brought in sociocracy to allow us all to have have more voices. Um, stronger than some of the parts. Um, I think that kind of speaks for itself. Um, and yeah, growing, growing is key. So um, I think that's what we're experiencing in local gov people now, sort of trying to find out a way to, to grow sustainably. Um, everyone delivering the work, um, not quite sure what that refers to. Uh, and doing something, not nothing. That sounds good. <laughs> Abby, can you uh, expand on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so everyone delivering the work of like, running the cooperative so um it will it, it's kind of related to power and responsibility um but it's actually like there's quite a lot of invisible work in running an organization whereas if you then have a structure 
um, where we've got like a fine, you'll see a diagram in a minute, um, like a finance circle and a people circle, it becomes much more explicit what those things are that some people are just kind of doing. Um, so it was kind of being having transparency about what the work is and being able to distribute it better. So we do things like rota for payroll. Nobody likes doing payroll. So we have, you know, it's just being able to distribute the work <coughs> and understand what it is. Um, and doing something, not nothing, it was more like for us, I think that might be, I don't know uh, whether this is relevant to Agile or not, but like we would, we were struggling to make decisions because we would get into a bit of a fight about it. <laughs> not, and so it was, we wouldn't end up doing anything. It's like, oh, I've, I, I'm too tired. Whereas this kind of helps you to move forward, even if it's a smaller step than your kind of preference might be. So it just helps us to just do something about it. It's something that we all want to improve. What can we do about it? And we were getting a little bit into a stalemate zone, um, which basically means you spend loads of time on it and then you don't get anywhere anyway. And then again, good enough, safe enough, and then we can reflect and iterate going forward. Mm -hmm. um, okay, next up, it's back over to you anyway, Abby, for Outlandish's sort of story a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, um, I think I mentioned right at the start, it's like we kind of advise people to kind of start slowly and do a small bit of it, again, using the principles, like try it, see how it works, and then do a bit more, and then do a bit more, and then do a bit more. Um, so we um, started around just setting a purpose throughout Lambish. We kind of, we were a group of friends that built digital stuff, and we were quite good at it, but we didn't go through the kind of formal process of like, what's our purpose and our vision? So um, that's how we started, was that actually we should probably have something that we all agree that we're trying to do, um, which was, you know, it wasn't that we were disagreeing, it just wasn't explicit. Um, and then it was around decision making, and that was, the key driver was around sharing power. Um, and we've got quiet voices, and we've got loud voices, and we have people with lots of ideas, and we have people that want to contribute to other people's ideas, like different kinds of people. Um, and it was, we were struggling to be sort of equally um, uh, included in decisions so consent was brought in to try and help with that and it really did but like we just used the consent process for quite a long time um, before we went into using the circles as sort of governance structure because we weren't, kind of weren't, weren't big enough uh, we didn't have a huge need for it so it's only when we started to become like uh, sort of 15 to 20 people that we were like okay we need to start to create working groups or circles around it um, and the key thing is like practicing. We still practice it. We still get it wrong. Like, you know, we're all humans and it's all complicated. Um, and so we're not saying we're experts and we know exactly how to do sociocracy and we're just like on fire. Sometimes we have a rubbish day and we're really rubbish to people. We don't communicate very well. So it's really just about practicing and using the principle of always like reflecting and saying, how can we do, do it better? Um, and not rushing it. So some people want to do it quicker than others, want anything actually. Um, and so it's just taking it at the pace that people feel safe enough to try. Um, always learning and we're, like one of our values is doing. So so a lot, again, sometimes the criticism of sociocracy is it sounds like you sit there and talk about stuff all the time, but we actually took it. We started using it so that we could be better at doing and it does help you do. Um, Finn's nodding. So I don't know if you've got anything else to bring in there. No, I mean, that's just a good point that, you know, it's not all about talking, it's about doing, it's about doing the right stuff with agreement with everyone. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so next slide is your circle structure at uh, Outlandish, which is very similar to that of Agile Collectors, actually. Yeah, so the, we've just, so you might as well just go straight to slide um, 17. Cause that, so in the middle is our, we've got eight members that own the co-op. And then we have like sub circles of all the different key sort of operational parts of Outlandish. Um, and we try, this is called double linking because one of the key principles is to have like two people in the center circle or e each circle that is linked um, in each so that you've got um, a sort of safety net to make sure that that transparency and exchange of information is more likely to happen well. So if you've just got one point of contact, then that's, uh, well, it's more powerful for that one person, but also there might be kind of breakdowns of communication, things like that. So it's like a general principle of trying to have like two people in each kind of working group. Um, and then we have, so I'm in quite a lot of things. I do quite a lot of the operations. So I'm in comms and biz dev, finance and people and members. 
Um, so it's not that you, you can be in as many as you have the time for or have the skills for. Um, and it's quite good to be in multiple, we find, because then you kind of get a bit more of a breadth of what's going on across the business. Um, and really what we try and do is push decisions away from the member circle. So we do legal stuff, like things around like key finance um, and obviously purpose and direction of the organisation. But otherwise, we try and not make decisions in the member circle to, and give the responsibility to the, the sort of sub circles. Which is very interesting and very similar to, to Agile Collective. Um, this is a diagram of our our circles, um, which is it's evolving, as Abby says. You know, it's not necessarily fixed, and we're we're constantly reviewing how things work. Um, where we have our members circle, which are the people uh, who uh, own and work in the business, um, and then the general circle, which might include other people. At the moment, they're the same because all everybody who is in the business owns the business and is a member of the co-op. Um, and then we have yeah a number of permanent circles like finance, support, tech. Um, business dev, um, and then various temporary circles. Um, like we have a sociocracy working group at the moment to look at, look at you know, reviewing and improving our, our usage of sociocracy, for example, um, uh, or a pay circle set up to review some pay, pay policy stuff. Um, and you know, they, they will be set up and then uh, evaporate, not evaporate. You know, they will come to a conclusion once they've done done what they need to do. Um, so yeah, quite similar. Similar, um, similar structures. Um, let's talk about consent. Okay. Um, yes. So the consent process, consent-based decision making, um, is a very key part of sociocracy, and is often the most like tangible thing that people kind of grasp first. Um, and it's not consensus and it's consent and there's there's a subtle difference of letters but people often will sort of switch around the two um and the quote from john buck there is consent does not mean agreement it means acceptance um and it's about there not being any problems with the change and i think from the dis uh, from the suggested change um and from the discussion we, i've had with finn it sounds like there's a sim it, what was it called um Lazy, lazy consensus. consensus. Yeah. So it sounds kind of a similar principle. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the for me, the like light bulb moment as to why this is so good for a group and for you as an individual is like the next slide, which is around the difference between your preference and your range of tolerance. So often with a kind of normal decision making process, somebody comes up with their preference for what should happen and they think it's right. And so they then advocate for that correct answer to the problem um, and try and get everybody to agree to it. That's the kind of consensus sort of approach, get everyone to agree. For me, like the really big difference with consent is you, even if you've got that idea that you think is right, being willing to kind of sit back and open up your range of tolerance to the answer being maybe slightly different to the one you think is right because it might actually then be, it might empower more people or you might get more buy-in from it. Um, or it might just be better because you hadn't thought of it like that because you can't, you're a human and you think you think of things from quite a closed sort of point of view. So the answer here is like in a workshop when we're in person, it won't be too much longer, hopefully. Um, I like to get snacks, I, I do the facilitation. And I, my preference would be chocolate, like I love chocolate. But my range of tolerance is anything sweet with the goal of keeping um uh, energy up so i want kind of something with what give me energy but then the third kind of concept is critical concerns or objections and so there might be an objection in the group that it can't have nuts in so i've I basically said i really like chocolate but someone else doesn't like chocolate but i'm okay with anything sweet so we can get biscuits and fruit and chocolate and all sorts but we can't get anything with nuts in because someone's allergic and that brings risk and danger into the situation. So that would be an objection. We can't have that happen because it damages the group in some way or stops you meeting your aim. So this kind of play in your head when you're thinking, am I being, am I in my preference zone where I think I'm right? Can I relax it a little bit more to allow other people's kind of inputs or needs to be met as well? So for me, that was like a real light bulb. This really works. 
because I could see that happening in decisions that actually decisions became better because we were allowing other people to bring stuff in that made the decision even better. And, and I think an interesting point there is that the objections, yeah, do with I, I think you mentioned it earlier are sort of uh, welcomed, uh, uh, encouraged because you know if someone's got a critical concern, it's something that you haven't thought about it, and it makes the proposal better. It improves the decision making process. Um, which yeah. that was a light bulb moment for me because <laughs> when we first started doing this, like you know, we were all kind of a bit. Oh, we don't want to don't want to raise an objection because we want the decision to be made. But often it will make a better decision by raising the concern. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a real mindset shift because we're used to thinking of someone objecting to a suggestion as bad. When actually, if you dig into why, what's the what's the worry? What's the concern? Then you <coughs> can mitigate it, and then it's it is often a much better decision. I think I've already said this, good enough for now, safe enough to try. We use, I probably say this like seven, I don't know. I'll bring it up, a week. I'll put it in again in a minute. Just keep it there, <laughs> drill it in. But it really works, it, it helps you to take the sort of scariness away from making a decision. It's like, okay, well, let's just make it simpler. If, you, if, it, if it feels too big, what's good enough for now and safe enough to try, so that, we, that doing kind of mentality. Um, so then I'm just going to quickly take you through what the, it's just a set of steps um, and you're in a group and you run it as a circle. So you go round, hopefully in the same order each time so that people know when, when their turn is, um, which helps with kind of lots of different kinds of people. I, I like to know that I, I've got a few minutes to think, or I know that I'm first, so I need to be like a bit more prepped or whatever. Um, and the first thing is to have a clear like goal of either the meeting or the circle. Um, and then a decision is made by someone making a proposal and running some rounds. Um, so this is a really simple example. Um, but for our workshops that we run to sort of um, help people practice the process, we have an aim of exploring the approach, giving it a go. So the aim of this session would be to explore this approach to decision making. And I'm going to bring a proposal to say everyone turns off their Slack notifications during the workshop so that we can really focus on it, because otherwise you might get you, you just won't be able to have all of your attention on it and you won't learn as much because you'll be distracted. And then we will go through um, a set of um, steps. So that if you can move on to the next one, Finn. Sorry, yeah, just, just, uh, yeah. So I would propose and say, I would, I would like everybody to turn off Slack notifications. And then we would do a round of clarifying questions. So do you understand the proposal enough to be able to consent or not to it? So it's not about bringing in, oh, well, you know, I don't use Slack, or like, can we keep WhatsApp on or whatever? It's just, do you understand what I'm proposing and, and the kind of remit of it? So really kind of focused, but asking yourself, do I understand enough to be able to do for this to happen or not? Um, and then we do a round of um, initial reactions, which is like an emotional response to it. It's like, I don't care. I hate it. I love it. Yay, whatever. But it's bringing in a little bit of that emotional intelligence because people might not care and that's useful or they might hate it. It just gives you a sort of temperature check. And then you explore whether anybody has any objections to it. So is there a reason why this proposal cannot happen? And we do run this in our, in our workshop. And there's quite often objections around being told what to do. And like the kind of um, agency, I'm at home, I have my job, and I need to keep Slack notifications on. Like there's kind of a, a reaction to it that's like, you can't tell me what to do. So that can come up as a critical concern, or it could come up as an initial reaction. But you basically gather the objections, if there are any. If there aren't any, it's passed and the decision is made. Um, and then as a group, you explore what those objections are and how you might mitigate them. So you might amend the proposal to being, um, well, it might you might actually pause the proposal entirely because everyone hates the idea of having a rule. And that's fine too. So it's a really important thing to remember that you don't have to pass the proposal. The information that gets brought in might tell you that you don't have to decide it at all. And that's fine too. That's good. You've, you've learned things as a group. Um, and then you mitigate, you kind of try and come up with a proposal that would mitigate the, the objections. And then you go have a final round of critical concerns or objections. And if nobody has any, then the, the proposal is passed. And that's the kind of uh, like, I don't know what, four minute walkthrough of the process. 
Um, but the best thing to do is, is to actually try it. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's one of, you know, one of the reasons why it, it's more appropriate. For, you know, there's a limit on the size of the group, really, that, that the efficiency, you know, can work with and hence the need for smaller circles to delegate the decision making process. Um, um, OK, so what's next up? Feedback and learning. Is this, mm -hmm. this me? Am I talking about this? It's you. It's me. Uh, well, feedback and learning is really important, isn't it? Basically, um, it's it's critical. This is an empirical process, and um, I like that word because it means it's based on evidence, right? So, just like the agile process is an empirical process, and you know, there's a lots of similarities between agile methodologies and sociocracy. Essentially, like you're trying something, and you're you know, you're, you've got a name, and so you can see if it works. Does it work? Let's review it. Did it work? Yes, no. Let's try something else. You know, let's learn from it. So. Um, so yeah, it's really important that it that, that we do that, that we we check. Um, there's no sociocracy without NVC. Uh, NVC stands for non-violent communication. Um, why is this in this bit? I'm not sure, but it's an important point. Um, Jerry from Sociocracy for All uh, is 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 quoted with this. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with non-violent communication, Marshall B. Rosenberg's book. Um, and uh, and podcasts and and audiobooks uh, is really good. I do recommend it. Um, but it's about communicating better, um, you know, and actually hearing hearing each other. Um, so um, back to the what are we talking about? Feedback and learning. Um, so I mean, it does come into that because it's about communication, of course. So yeah, agility, iterative steps towards a goal. You know, you lead, do, measure. Um, and if you're familiar with agile processes, this is the same kind of thing. It's an iterative process where you're trying something, you know, setting up uh, user stories in agile, doing it, and then like you know, measuring whether it's actually solved solved the the the, um, the need, the user need. Uh, in this case, any decision, you know, should have a purpose to it, and and we should set set some kind of uh, feedback loop to uh, to test whether that you know the decision has has uh, resulted in the outcome that that we wanted, um, and if not, we try something else. So um, that was a real aha moment for me as a sort of agile <laughs> lover and you know um, a long time sort of uh, yeah uh, promoter of, of agile as a process. Um, and it makes a lot of sense that yeah any decisions you know safe enough to try, um, um, let's try it and and, and measure it. Um, this is another nice quote. Lots of nice quotes in it. This one's from Rumi. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. Um, and you know, again, we get things wrong. We're human, as we keep saying. Like, you know, let's try something, and it's safe enough to try if we're going to review it in a short enough time period. Um, you know, bigger decisions may want to be broken down, but you know, let's 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 not worry too much about you know whether it's absolutely the right thing or not. Let's let's try it and see, build the evidence. Um, so what have we learned? What have we learned? Sarah has asked a question oh, that great. I think is quite a good one to answer. So um, do participants need to be able to understand practice and buy into the decision-making process for consent versus consensus, or can these discussions happen and decisions be made without people being trained? What do you think, Finn? Um, I think... Yes, people can be involved. You can learn by doing, essentially, um, and that's the best way to to, to learn. Um, consent versus consensus. Um, I, th I think, like my underlying question, really, there is to use use the well, probably not correctly, but the circles that you described there. So, I work in a government organisation where you know decisions be, need to be made, and you don't necessarily have the time, and people certainly don't have the inclination to buy into a different way of doing things. Um, I might be underestimating people here; they might, but sometimes they might not. Um, so I'm just wondering whether, in this particular scenario, this is actually something that you'll need to guide people to and talk through before actually trying it, or whether you can kind of. Um, uh, I don't know, do it, do it, uh, not do it to people, but kind of get get the benefits without having to kind of um, guide people through the process at the same time. Because then you've got people to having to buy into the process and buying into making the decision rather than just buying into making the decision, if that makes sense. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it definitely does benefit from some facilitation in, you yeah. know, for running through that that process, running rounds and, and trying to make sure everyone has, you know, has the chance to, to speak and everyone ha is heard and people and, you know, that the concerns are acknowledged and realised and, and actually that does lead to a better better outcome. 
um, mm. that, that part of the process definitely, you know, facilitation is, you know, if you start with a group of people who've never done it before, that will be harder than if you've got somebody in the group who, who has. Um, I don't know, Abby, what do you think on that? Is that your experience as well? I think definitely like you can introduce people to the process um, by doing but it's how you start it in an organization that's the tricky thing. And I, and I would say you start small with people who are interested in it. So like often we'll, in our workshops, we'll say, bring somebody else as well so that two of you get introduced to the idea and then you use it between yourselves. So you can use consent with two people, you can use it with a bigger group, whatever, but it's just starting to learn it and, and feel confident with it. And then widen the circle a little bit and widen the circle a bit. It doesn't work so well if it's like top down, okay, everybody, we are going to do sociocracy. Because the kind of the point of it is that it comes from the people. Um, so you kind of grow it kind of organically and slowly with people who do want to dedicate the time and are able to and have decisions to make. So it's kind of finding that group or that other one person if you're interested in it and starting and doing by trying and then and then growing the kind of understanding and confidence that way. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to double click on that pushback that it, people do sometimes push back on the process because they perceive that it's unnecessary and takes a long time. And um, yeah. I guess uh, I want to hit people over the head when they do that because it's like, what's the alternative? We'll kick this document around for the next two months and then we'll lose interest. So, yeah, I don't know why people really push back against the process. I've found it really hard to get traction with it. I'm finally getting traction, but there is a weird sort of aversion to it for some reason. I don't quite understand. Yeah. I think it's probably not an aversion specifically to the Pro, the consent process is an aversion to changing what they're used to. So like any change is, is harder work, whether it ends up being easier or not. And I think also there's a difference between a decision and a good decision. Um, so decisions can be made that never get done because they didn't get buy-in. They just like pushed it through and it, you know, nobody really cared about it or whatever. Whereas this process really helps people to buy into it and say, yeah, okay, I, I get why you're doing that and I'll support it rather than feeling coerced or pressured or we've only got five minutes, I need a decision now kind of thing. Um, so so the benefit of that over the long term is it's much more efficient because the decisions that get made are much more likely to be done. And I, I find like when you don't do it like that, decisions can be made and then they just kind of fade away. And so whatever time you spent was a waste anyway. Um, so yeah, good decision versus a decision is like one of the big benefits. Shall we crack on to the next slide? I think is, 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 this is kind of learning from your side, Abby. Is it? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so this is lots of things we have learned and we're still learning. Um, and some of those things, exactly what I was talking about, is like the efficiency of it is over the longer term rather than the meeting you're having right now. So sometimes it can be like, well, we could have got a decision quicker, but actually it's a better decision. Um, and in doing that and involving people genuinely and really listening to them and then being able to input into a decision, it builds like trust so that the next time you do it even quicker because you've learned something about each other and you trust that this person's coming the right, from the right place. So you have less kind of fear around the changes that they're potentially suggesting. Um, and that makes a calmer workplace and a more confident. So like lots of our decisions that probably would have taken a lot longer now, uh, like a couple of years ago or whatever, don't take very long because there's just that kind of calmness, like trust that the person has done the work and has thought about it and thinks this is like a really good idea or whatever our circle has. So it feels a lot calmer and less stressful, which is, I hadn't really thought would be a benefit because it's, you know, it's running a business is quite stressful but it is much yeah karma is the right word um and we're still making mistakes like sometimes it does like blow up and someone's just got really upset with something and we've never it was not predicted um and it's not so much a mistake it's just that the unpredictable still happens and we're all complex and don't understand everything about each other um and what genuinely working collaboratively brings lots of benefits, but it also takes a lot, it takes time and patience. Um, and it's like totally worth it. 
I, I, I enjoy my work so much more because of the collaborative, like the real collaborative behaviours that we that we use. Anything else, Finn, from your? Uh, no, your I, th I think I'd uh, echo that. I mean, I think another thing I've noticed is that we're much better at making decisions, like um, and and running proposals. You know, it takes practice, but now we are much better at it. And, and lots of lots of proposals, the decisions happen very quickly, and then the ones that need mm -hmm. to have more discussion. Are flagged up as such and so we focus our discussions on the things that need to be discussed which is mm -hmm. you know more efficient so um yeah no it's it's, it's great um uh, but yeah always learning and always you know evolving and uh, still making mistakes and that's fine that's that's you know but acknowledging them and having a process by which we can we can continue to evolve um so let's have a little look about how this might look for local gov drupal going forward um i just sort of sketched out some circles, thinking about what we've got in our local gov governance, um, local gov Drupal governance structure at the moment. Um, worth noting for anyone who doesn't know that we've got a memorandum of association, so a memorandum of understanding, which is something that councils um, uh, wanted to, to be able to sign something and sort of set out what the agreement is. In that is defined the product group and the technical group, product group being the group of um, product managers, product owners, uh, product people, web managers from from councils, and technical group being devs and uh, uh, other such people. Maybe content designers are more in the product group, um, but these two groups are kind of quite defined in our documents, um, and um, and that's kind of where it's it's left at the moment. So thinking about um, the fact that that we have these two groups and they're growing, and the efficiency of trying to make decisions in them is is becoming a challenge. Um, we also have this kind of this kind of project group now, which is you know part of the funded uh, funded phase. So I called it strategy slash project team. At the moment, it's a project team. Um, and we're kind of um, doing, and we are making decisions, and we are doing, and we're integrating with the product group and the technical group. And who knows, maybe in the future, there will be that kind of centralized project team, strategy team, funded or otherwise, or voluntary. Um, and um, so yes, yeah, thinking about it in that in that kind of in that kind of way. Um, and then working groups is something that we've touched on. So uh, the three things on the bottom left, um, working groups for alert banners, for microsites, for forms. Um, so smaller groups of, of people who are particularly interested and able to push forward with a particular area of functionality, such as uh, the microsites functionality, you know, doing the research, the definition, what is it that we need to do, user stories, you know, um, really defining the functionality that needs to be brought into the to the project, uh, to the product even. Um, but that these might be temporary, you know, uh, time limited um, circles. So like working groups being a circle that's not necessarily a, a permanent thing. Um, and then also thinking about maybe sub sub circles off the technical group specifically for front end, i.e. front end theming, HTML, CSS and back end or, or other uh, more technical stuff. Uh, and then possibly communications is something that we've talked about a bit already um, so far and is kind of something that needs its own um, uh you know team uh group circle working group whatever it may be um but then i was thinking about the decision making you know where decisions actually get gets made and i thought i'd color it like this to sort of highlight that that really as we grow it's not really possible to make decisions in product group or in the technical group they're too big there's too many people and it's not going to be efficient so delegating those decisions down to smaller groups either working groups uh, possibly the strategy team although that might if that grows that might need to be subgroups as well um so that the, the the bigger groups are really for information sharing so we might have product group meetings or technical group meetings where people are bringing things from the working groups or from the smaller circles say hey this is what we've done here's the decisions we've made here's the things we're thinking about and just really share lots of information around such that people in the in the the, the smaller groups can have that information to then go forward and make decisions and push forward on whatever it may be the forms or the the communications work um, so that's just an idea how how we might evolve this, uh, <coughs> you know, and, and make use of some of these principles um, and looking at you know efficient decision making. But obviously, um, yeah, it's all up for discussion. Um, that's 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 all I've got. Um, mm -hmm. So should we take some questions now in case anyone needs to shoot off in five minutes? Um, and we will share these slides. Uh, in fact, I'll give you a link to them now because they've got some links yeah, at the end yeah. and they've got some books as well, the links to the books, which are good books to read. But, um, but yeah, has anyone got any questions? Tim's got his hand up. Um, are you being coy about adult development or do you just think there's not enough time to go into it? 
Sorry, say that again, Coy, about? Adult development. How do you mean? Like how it's changed you as individuals or your group of uh, your group of friends. I mean, are you the same people that you were when you started out on this journey? I don't think I'm the same person I was last week, to be honest. Ah. <laughs> I, I'm rapidly, <laughs> rapidly changing and, uh, um, you know, yeah, evolving and, you know, always open to new things. But I mean, that's that's kind of my my nature. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think, Abby? What... I'm definitely not the same person at all. So like. I think I talked about kind of mindset change and that's for the group, but also individually. And so I think for me, it's like the biggest thing is around genuinely being curious about what's going on for other people um, and how interesting that is. Like how like how many light bulbs can go off in a single meeting where you're like, mm. I didn't know that about you. Mm. Um, and I always was interested in people, otherwise I wouldn't have kind of... I, got into this so quickly I suppose um but it's yeah it's genuinely like changed my habits as as how I communicate and how I think about communicating and realizing how important it is to listen rather than jabber on all the time so um yeah that's how I, I've become more curious yeah and I think the the Marshall Rosenberg you know nonviolent communication book and and it's it's podcast there's an audio book on audible and spotify listening and reading and lots of that actually that was probably the, the the thing that affected me the most and changed the way that i communicate and listen and yeah um that that's all part, sort of for me part of the sociocracy um yeah uh game <laughs> activities whatever yeah that, that, i think that's that's that, that's really good but it's a good question tim thanks thanks i've got a fly Okay, well, thanks for coming, and yeah, good luck with your next thing. Um, thanks. Any other questions from anyone? We've got David, Will, and Matt with their hands up, but I have no idea which order that was. Let's take them in that order. David. Hello. Um, thanks. It's been um, it's really interesting. What I was going to ask is, um, uh, maybe I'm coming at this from like an agile perspective, but just keen to hear what are the you know, sort of when you talk about agile and it's like um, daily stand ups, sprint planning, retros, all the kind of nuts and bolts and things that make it work, kind of being a slave to the board, having everything time box, those kind of things. Um, what's kind of the equivalent in sociocracy? Do you want to go first, Abby? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not replacing those things; it's um, complementing them. So, I, so we used to, we use agile project management for our projects too. So we do all of those things. Um, it's more so when it comes when it combines or like comes together or whatever. Particularly in the planning sessions, so consenting to the goal, consenting to the priorities that are given. If it's not a particular client setting the priorities, but a group of you. Um, consenting to the like um, maybe the velocity points that you do or the you know the, the estimates however you actually define how big the tasks are In, so planning we use it quite a lot um, and goal setting so like over the whole project so we have a kickoff session and we would use consent to agree with the client what the overall goal for a project is um, so it's complementing rather than replacing does is that was that the question well, I kind of, um, I mean, I mean, I'm, I, I understand that there is a complementary thing. I was just wondering about, you know, kind of, it's almost like when you're evangelizing about it to someone that, that doesn't know, it's kind of like, what are the, the key things? So it would be the, the circles and the consent and those kind of things. I was just wondering. So yeah, yeah there, those kind of I mean, you mentioned retros. Retros are really important in sociocracy, right? Having a retrospective of, you know, how a circle's working or how a working group's working or, you know, how that, that's where you get the the iteration, right? Where you reflect on what's going well, what's not, what you want to improve, and then feeding that back into the the processes and the, um, the how, how you're working together. Um, so um, thanks, Sarah. Um, so, so, yeah, retros are really important. That's definitely sort of one of the... I guess rituals or, or ceremonies or whatever that, that that you know sort of um, should not be forgot. Just like in agile, like doing sprints without retros, <laughs> you lose the iteration part and the feedback loop. Um, <coughs> there, there are some other sort of um, I guess sort of cultural ceremonies type things like um, 
checking in at the beginning of a meeting, like to check in where how people actually are, what they're bringing to that meeting to make sure that you're communicating better within the meeting. Somebody might be having a really bad day and just like kind of formalizing that to some extent. And Abby mentioned like consenting to the plans of that meeting. So just consenting to the agenda, making sure that, you know, making making those meetings efficient and just kind of good practice of meetings really anyway, but but just really being clear because at this point we're actually delegating power to a subgroup of people who want to make some decisions so let's make sure that they're doing those things checking checking the agenda writing minutes and you know documenting that so that makes the transparency and um yeah sort of makes make sure that everyone's kind of communicating better and hopefully making better decisions so those kind of things i think all add up to the kind of the things you do to make it work which kind of i think was where your question was coming from david yeah sorry i, I should, probably should have said rituals and cultural things would it would have just made that a whole, whole lot easier <laughs> <laughs> um and there are probably other things as well but you know they're, they're definitely key things and then obviously you know the proposal consent process where where um where that's needed um mm -hmm. oh, I'd, I'd add one thing about like a uh, key cultural thing is around the the sort of autonomy and like self sort of responsibility of making sure you understand and i think that's kind of very similar to agile is like you have a task and it's if you're estimating it you need to be able to understand enough about it to feel safe that your estimate is kind of accurate so that's sort of asking yourself do i understand this so that i can consent rather than expecting someone to kind of explain it to you or guide you through it it's kind of it's it's a proactive kind of cultural thing rather than being told what to do which i think really matches sort of ad how people try and live and do agile thanks what should we get to will now will you have a question a, a comment and a question how annoying is that um welcome, yeah, uh, welcome. <laughs> Was that person. your comment? Though? That was the comment. Yeah, <laughs> I I like the good enough, safe enough, and that's something that that I've done a lot in sort of previous work, and something we ought to do more of. I think we're starting to do more of that, so that that felt great. I guess my my question: Can you go back to the organisation slide mm -hmm. for a second? So it's pro it was probably just a, a sort of practical thing, really. And this one, yeah, this one. So. So assume, you know, in, in the local Gov's Drupal setup, there are lots of different organizations and we're saying, OK, well, let's maybe form a, a forms working group or a microsites one. How, what's your experience of doing that cross organization? You know, if the practical things are fitting in with people's diaries and the other things they're doing, and the other projects that they're running, because I think that's going to be one of the hurdles that we have, because in theory, I could see all of this working perfectly, but in practice, it feels tricky and I just wondered if you had any experience of that yeah I mean this definitely works across organization I think it's the same principles that it is what's the aim um, and going back to like what is in a circle um, I, I can't remember what slide it is but like the working um, agreement so who's paying for the time so like with an organization it's clear who's the organization is paying for your time but with a cross organization it's like who is actually paying for this and who is responsible for it from an organizational point of view. Um, but the key thing within the circle, once you have the sort of uh, those things agreed is around what is your aim and domain um, and what roles are you bringing in? Um, so it, it doesn't matter what the legal structure is once you have established what a circle is and what the point of it is. But you do have to have that agreement beforehand with a cross organizational kind of um, circle structure that who is who does have the decision making where is the legal responsibility um yeah you know, and I, I think the, the budget and resources you know like how much time what does it take to be part of a working group in local gov drupal how much time is going to be needed for me as a member of a working group and over what period of time okay are we talking about three months maybe two hours a week or something like that is that can i commit that yes i can okay you know if actually no that's not going to be possible then i don't really have time to 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 do that right and so we need people you know to we need to be clear about that i guess or make that decision at the beginning of the working group you know what's the what's what, what's involved obviously the aim is really important but yeah can we what are we trying to do how much time is it going to take and can we can we commit to that and then i think that might answer some of the questions around 
obviously you know diary management and just sort of agreeing to when the meeting the meeting schedule and agenda we're going to meet once a week once every two weeks whatever it's going to be um for an hour at this time let's just set that up at the beginning set the structure and say right within this period of time we want to have the thing done that is our aim that might be getting forms into local gov drupal and so mm. it you know it does take it takes those things really doesn't it so mm-hmm. uh, i think i think that can be done by the people who you know and then they'll become self-selecting and self-unselecting if people are too busy then obviously that, that that's not going to work and mm-hmm. we need to have have those people there um does that kind of um, answer your question well i i think so i mean that th- i don't think there'll ever be any argument about sort of making sort of farming out decisions or make or pushing them out to the smallest circle because that feels like we're heading in that direction anyway. I think it's just more about the practicalities of this across mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 12 very busy organizations and, yeah. and and showing the value. I think that's the challenge. I'm just mm-hmm. thinking yeah. back to some of the conversations I've had over the last couple of weeks. We all want to put time into this. I, I can sense that. But when? When are we going to do it? Mm-hmm. How are we going to mm-hmm. do it? And, and the viability of that, I think it it hangs or it stands or falls on that, really. So we've got to pay a lot of attention to that. Yeah. That, that, but, that, but I think it's brilliant. I think it's all brilliant. So the person that brought it to Outlandish and, and then brought it to Agile called Pete Burden, and he um, used to say, he says this a lot, and it really annoys me, he's like, but use the process. And I'm just, I'm going to say the same thing. And it's about not implementing that diagram all at once. It's about going, what's good enough for now and safe enough to try? So what's the smallest group that can actually agree okay we've got these decisions to make let's try it and then how can we grow it one step bigger and another step bigger um and take it at at that sort of pace rather than like having to work all of the 12 organizations like sets of responsibilities and time commitments all at once because that's massive and it would freak me out so absolutely (laughs) and that's kind of that's kind of what we're starting to do on the on the we started a kind of working group around the let banners and just kind of I was just thinking that a, it might well. there's a couple of things that are in flight that we just need to firm up. You know, alert banners yeah. is one front end about to start. We talked about comms and we need something. So, you know, those things don't kind of half exist and they should really exist and we should see how they work. Mm-hmm. And then that will inform whether we want to continue or what we need to change, how we exactly. want to grow. Do review, yeah. iterate, evidence, you know, can it? something else <laughs> or yeah evolve um matt you had a question as well are you still there yeah Hi, matt. Hi. <laughs> um it's actually following up um quite neatly on will's initial question i think i'm i'm yeah the, the idea of have each each um circle having its own aim or, or kind of purpose or objective you know it feels like a really a really neat one what I wonder about, about is in terms of practicalities of like process when the A might change or, you know, where we're building forms, but actually uh, a forms module, but actually that's a never ending process. And, you know, is, is there what I quite liked about, I think I've read a blog post about it before this is that you can have some quite time bound things, which gives you an opportunity to, to, to work up something that is good enough. And then actually just kind of like almost ramp it down. Um, and then and then leave it alone. But then equally, you know, Finn, what you were saying previously was about people self-selecting and also self-unselecting. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious about your um, your experiences with that um, and how it's how it actually plays out in practice. Do you tend to kind of ramp down groups and then spin up new ones quite regularly, for example? I mean, in Agile Collective, yes, we have working groups that have started and stopped, you know, as as needed. Um, I mean, we. Very quickly around COVID, you know, lockdown, we <laughs> spinned up a word, span up, spun up, whatever, a working group uh, around, around, you know, sort of emergency reaction to, to what we're going to do around that. And um, and then, you know, at some point that was, we didn't need it anymore. And then we took it down. And that was, you know, uh, maybe an emergency response thing. Um, but yeah, other working groups I mean, often formed through a proposal. So like, you know, a proposal to start a working group around a particular thing. We want to achieve this thing. Clarifying questions, you know, consent. Great. Okay, we've got a working group and there will be time back. And, and you know, have a definition of when it's done, basically. You know, what is the thing we're trying to do? And then at that point, the working group is is, is finished. Um, so again, on the forms thing, that would make sense to to, yeah, to not reach too high, trying not to have something that's never ending, trying to have a tangible, you know, minimum viable product of 
forms in the local gov Drupal doing a particular thing, whatever that might be. Um, but that might need to evolve through the work that the group does. <laughs> so part of the beginning of that group will be researching and defining what the MVP is for for this initial, you know, piece of work. So, um, so I think, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, the, the aim might need to evolve as well. Yeah, you hit on it, Finn, I think with it's the classic thing with Agile as well, which is what does done actually mean, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I suppose that has to be part of, um, I think there was another thing earlier on about defining like how we're going to work together and what agreeing definitions and things like that. Is that something that you tend to do or is that, am I overthinking it basically? No, I don't think you're overthinking it. I think, yeah, agreed. Defining what done means and defining yeah, defining it as part of a part of that part of the circles. Where's it gone? You know, those things that make a good circle basically, which you know is here somewhere. Um, you know, yeah, working clear aim and domain, working agreements. You know, defining these things, and you will have a document which is basically the what the circle is, and we can refer back to that. Something I found really useful is when you're in a working group or in a circle, is actually looking back at the aim and domain regularly to remind yourself what it is that we're trying to do here, because you can get you know, off sidetracked and, and yeah. Um, and uh, I think actually a lot of the theory of change work that we've done on the project so far will feed into these circles and like link in, you know, cause it's, it's sort of concentric aims, right? The aim of this circle supports the, you know, an outcome of our bigger theory of change, which supports the name of the wider project, which supports the name of the product. So, um, so yeah, iterating down um, Russian dolls of circles, I guess. Um, Thank you. I have to shoot now, but this has been a really great session. Thank you. I just working groups with clear aim and domain, for example. So we could do that with the ones that are in flight, uh, like the alert banners, maybe the news one as well. It might be two that are kind of um, good. Maybe try the proposal consent process in smaller groups. So maybe in, in those working groups, if we've got particular things to decide, maybe we could try that and maybe run further facilitated sessions, you know, or training sessions uh, with working groups. Um, um, so, you know, either with the help of Abby and, and, and Aaron and, and people from um, Building Out, um, uh, or, you know, I could try, Liam could try, you know, we've got a, got a fair amount of experience in Agile Collective as well, but, you know, having somebody to help facilitate some of those, you know, um, some of those sessions would, would may, maybe help as well. Um, any other suggestions for other next steps that we might want to do from this? For those of us left. They're the books. Read, read, read them. They're good. <laughs> um, and yeah, give us a shout, of course. You know, you can email abby at outlandish.com or finn at agile.coop. And uh, uh, happy to talk more. Mm -hmm. And the guy um, the guy that said you introduced to it was Peter. Pete Burden. Someone? Pete Burden. Pete Burden. He's up on like slide three or something, isn't he? Oh, he's not actually named, but it's it's the one to my right. <laughs> uh, number four from the left, second from the right. Yeah. Okay. And is and is that kind of like the is he the guy that's like the modern sort of agile manifesto equivalent, or who would you say that is? Well, I mean, Ted and Jerry are like the sort of sociocracy for all kind of duo that that have written the books. Um, Pete is a, a team and organizational development um, coach. So, so he doesn't just bring in a sociology. Um, it's very much about like uh, building openness, understanding and trust, which involves like lots of kind of communication practices and, and things like that. So he's, it's a wider remit. He doesn't bring in sociology to every organization because it does require you wanting a reasonably flat hierarchy and some organizations don't want that. So um the consent process doesn't necessarily fit with all organizations um so yeah he, he would call himself an organizational development coach would you agree finn i don't know yeah i <laughs> no reason <laughs> to discuss <laughs> um and what is can he be where's what's his contact details um i will put it on the slide at the end here's his linkedin as well so i'll put that in as well That's brilliant. But yeah, but, but, but building, building out, you know, um, do provide training and facilitation and sessions like that. That's right, isn't it, Abby? Yeah, and that includes what... him. So he's one of the yeah. facilitators that so, work with, with teams. 
so so uh you know if people are interested in further you know uh yeah stuff get in touch with abby or pete or aaron or people from building out and um yeah well abby thank you so much for taking time to join us on this nice uh, one. that was like super super useful um and it's a shame Aaron couldn't join us because he was away on holiday. Uh, that would have been good too. But um, but yeah, it's been really good to have uh, the ability to share stuff from Outlandish and from Agile Collective and, you know, get our hive mind and your amazing slides. That's so right. Always. Um, so I've just added Pete, you can see there. Oh, uh, yeah. Address in there. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm just going to say my usual spiel at the end is thank you to both of you for your time. And this has been amazing. So and I'm, I'm sure we'll definitely take this forward. Um, we have a YouTube channel that still doesn't have a short URL. But we have got 53 subscribers. So we were 47 away from getting a short URL. So please um, subscribe here. Please, please accept you can't um, like and subscribe. And there'll be this. I'll put this video up provided I've recorded it correctly. And also the one from the previous session, which was GDPR that Anatech ran, which was also great. So we've got lots of good material now. So um, thank you for adding to our fantastic library. We really appreciate it. Good stuff. Lovely. Thank you for having me. Have a nice. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you.